is for sale, my lord. It is not love. Even you. Even you must have a price. I am neither a buyer. Nor a seller of love. Suppose, my lady, a man offered you a more treasured gift. Say, a kingdom. And you need not serve seven years to get it. Tell me, Esther of Zeus, who are you really? Tell me of your people. Teach me of your ways. My father taught me. It takes the glory of God to conceal a matter. And the honor of kings to search it out. Then marry me. <laughs> and we shall spend an eternity discovering this truth. the Hallmark Channel. Brian, do you need some? Heather? Ron, Terry, anybody? No? Carol? No? Okay. This is a clip from the uh, movie based on Esther called One Night with the King, and it brings to our attention what we have to decide right from the very beginning, and this is on the back of your bulletin. We must decide which version of the story of Esther we really want to embrace. Do we want to embrace the uh, the sanitized version of Esther, or do we want to embrace the biblical version of Esther? Now, the, uh, the sanitized version, I want to say this to some degree, uh, it's necessary. Uh, sometimes we have to sanitize some things that are in the Bible, and we got to put them in this uh, God's uh, little book for the kids. So some of these stories are very sanitized. That's age appropriate. It's all understandable. There's a four-page thing in here on Esther. It's very sanitized, very pretty, very nice. Um, but the problem becomes this. The problem what often happens is as we, as we grow into adulthood, we, we, we hang on to the sanitized version. Uh, we don't take the time to reread the story and examine it more deeply as adults. Now, the reason we don't do that, maybe a number of reasons, maybe because uh, the version that we saw on the flannel graph growing up or watched in VeggieTales or on the Hallmark Channel, we really liked that version. We don't want to give it up, right? That happy bubble, we don't want to see that burst by dealing with some messy, uncomfortable details about the stories and the characters that we kind of idolized as kids. Bob can tell you, we just went through this in Judges and we, uh, the character of Samson. I mean, we grew up, we like to think of him as Captain America, just holding back uh, the godly man, holding back the Philistines and, you know, from the Israelites, rather than, as we discovered, a pleasure-driven, not so bright, egomaniac, more like the character Kronk in the Emperor's New Groove, rather than a mighty man of God. Now, God still used him. I say all this to warn you that, that some of what we read in Esther chapter 2, it can be messy. It was for me. It can be unsettling to our sanitized version of the story of Esther that we grew up with. And I want to say, give two qualifying statements before we dive in. So number one would be this. In the book of Esther, we have all the information we need, but not all the information we want. And man, does that drive a guy like me crazy. I want all the details, all the motives. 
But it makes it hard because of that to make some really definitive decisions. The author records actions made by the characters, but most of the time, the author chooses not to tell us little or nothing about the motives of why they did or did not do something. So we must be careful not to be too harsh and judgmental. And number two, my other thing I'd like to see off the top is even though number one is true, I will make some interpretive judgments based on some things that are inferred from this story and some things that we learn in other passages in the Old Testament. I've reached uh, these conclusions based on a lot of study. <laughs> They're in line with some other biblical scholars, but not all, of the, all biblical scholars. And the interpretive judgments, these interpretive judgments, primarily have to do with the two main Jewish characters in the story, and that is Mordecai and Esther. And quite a bit, what I've read the past two weeks, has one of two extreme opinions about Esther and Mordecai. Okay, the one extreme would be this, to kind of put on those rose-colored glasses and to simply look at both Mordecai and Esther as true, biblical, fairly flawless characters and heroes and heroines who are doing their best in a pagan culture and in some very different, difficult circumstances. And they also see this relationship between Esther and King Xerxes as kind of a fairy tale romance, just like the Hallmark Channel has, that God's going to use to save the Jewish people. The other extreme, let's go to the other extreme, is to see both Esther and Mordecai as, at least in the beginning of the story, and that's where we're at today, as people who have little or no interest in pleasing God, but only make decisions based on what was best for them, no matter if that meant they had, that they had to completely abandon their Jewish identity and abandon the, God's commands. So those are the two extremes we get to deal with. I hope, although this still may stress him, that I hit a balance between those two extremes. Although I will say again, I wish more details were in the story, and I will say to you, you can go home and do your own research and come up maybe with some other conclusions. With that aside, let's dive in. If you've got a Bible, uh, again, we encourage you to look at your Bible. We don't put all these verses up on the screen. Esther chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. It opens with King Xerxes. He's just returned from this war. He hasn't done well. He's a little depressed about that. Then he's doubly depressed because he remembers, oh, yeah, I don't have a queen anymore either. So one of the king's personal attendants suggests that they be allowed to search the whole per vast Persian empire. That's 50 million people. You know, not all those aren't women, of course, but there's a lot of women in that 50 million. To search for a queen. Round them up, round up all the beautiful virgin women in the em girls mainly, and put them under the care of the king's eunuch, Haggai, where he can work with them and prepare them for this one-night stand with King Xerxes. And as it says in verse 4, you can read it there, whoever pleases King Xerxes the most would take Queen Vashti's place. Now, when it says whoever pleases, we're not talking here about cooking skills, about uh, intellectual prowess here. We're talking about whoever satisfies this king sexually. We'll see more about that in a minute. Now, we can further un unsanitize the hallmark version of this story by identifying what we're actually reading here. Okay, what we're reading here is no less than modern-day sex trafficking. Young virgin girls between the ages of 13, 16, they're rounded up against their own will, against the will of their parents, and they're forced to come and audition to either be the next queen, which if you're rounded up, you hope you at least maybe that would happen, or just be part of the king's already existing harem. Basically, these young, frightened teenage girls would have one chance to sexually satisfy King Xerxes. Uh, if they did, they might get a, like a second call-up, a second round. But if they did not, then unlike the Bachelor show where the girls get to go home, you don't get to go home. You're, you're stuck there. You're, if you're not chosen, you're banished to the king's harem, which was a, a group that mainly consisted of the king's female slaves and all his concubines, usually located in a building next to the, the palace. And you're never to return home. You're, you're never to marry again. You're stuck there. What are you stuck for? You're stuck there to hope that you can one day serve the king by just waiting for his call to come and sexually please him some any given night. 
even if you did get to be queen. <laughs> that does not mean you would be the king's only lover. That's why he has a harem. And that's why king, uh, queen, queen Esther, later in the story, when she's told she has to go before the king, remember what she says? Hey, man, he hasn't called on me in 30 days. That means he's calling on some other girls. Okay? It just, it just means if you're queen, it does mean something. You get to avoid living in the harem, and you get to be in the palace with more freedoms and luxuries, and you get more chances to sexually satisfy King Xerxes and bear him children. One more thing to note about this King Xerxes, just to paint the story as it's painted. He had a reputation for being one of the most sexually driven kings of all time. Matter of fact, uh, Josephus, a Jewish historian, records that his harem had at least 400 women in it. And Xerxes was such a womanizer that eventually he begins hitting on the women of his own palace officials, which lead to his own palace officials stabbing him to death in bed in 465 B.C. So, it's kind of quiet in here, right? That's the unsanitized version, right? The unsanitized version is this is a very dark and bleak picture. And not that this doesn't go on in other parts of the world as well, even today. But this is a very dark and bleak picture that this young teenage Esther is just suddenly thrown into. Now, verses 5 and 6, we're introduced to one of the two Jewish co-stars of the story whose name is Mordecai. Mordecai is a Jew from a, from the tribe, a family that descends from the tribe of Benjamin. His great-grandparents and grandparents were taken into uh, the Babylonian captivity. They were exiled in 570 B.C. Mordecai's grandparents, great-grandparents are listed there, Shimei and Kish. Uh, they came to Persia, and apparently they did not return to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity, although they could have returned. And Mor Mordecai then was born in Persia, and he's given a Persian name. No Hebrew name is mentioned at all for Mordecai. Up on the screen, this is his name, and this is what it means. Uh, Mordecai is, is uh, from the Persian Marduka which means a man or worshiper of Marduk, who is the male deity of the Babylonians. Doesn't sound like a very biblical, godly name. That's what, we'll get to that in a minute. Verse 7. Verse 7, we're told that Mordecai, he had a cousin named, and now we're given the Hebrew name, Hadassah. Um, he had adopted a Hadassah after her parents apparently had died somehow and raised her. Her Persian name was Esther, and the writer notes that she had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Nothing is said of her character, but according to Jewish rabbis, she was one of the four most beautiful women in the world, along with Sarah, Rahab, and, of course, my wife, Kelly. <laughs> Brownie points. Uh, actually, Abigail was the other one. If my wife was Jewish, she would have been in there. But, okay. The name Esther comes from the Persian here. Persian word for star, it, it could also maybe be a Hebrew transliteration of Ishtar, which was the name of the Babylonian goddess of love and war. And by the end of the story, you might think maybe Esther fits that category, actually. Uh, regardless, Esther's the only person in the story who's given two names, both her Persian name and her Jewish name. And some interpret this as the author's way of trying to depict for us Esther as a young woman trying to navigate in this, this difficult two-world culture that she's in. That is, the Jewish world in which she was raised and this rich and affluent Persian world in which she's about to be thrust into. Now, we might take a slight pause here to begin asking a few questions. We'll ask these throughout the morning. And the first question would be this. Why, if the Jews were allowed to return to their homeland... After those 70 years of Babylonian captivity, in 570, 538 B.C., Cyrus said, you can return home. Nehemiah heads to charge there. Why are there Jews still living in Susa? As you remember, only about 42,600 or so actually returned. Now, in Susa, there's an estimate there's 1 million Jews living in Susa who have not returned. 
Now, there could be many answers to that question. Maybe some of them were simply too old and very true that uh, they could not head back. Maybe some thought they were heeding these words spoken by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 25, 5, and 6, coming up on the screen. These words were spoken just when the Jews were going into captivity. And here's what God told them. He said, build homes, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Well, we can surely say that they kept that charge, right? They increased the number. But in so doing, in heeding the the couple first verses, they kind of ignored this verse that comes just a few verses later. Would you read it with me? This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place, this place being Jerusalem. God's plan was for his people to return to Jerusalem, and while some may have been too old to make that trip, the majority, at least we reason this from other Old Testament scriptures, I did not return due to one thing, the comforts of Babylon. They were established there, they were living a fairly comfortable life, And they knew it was a long journey back, and they knew it was going to take a lot to rebuild Jerusalem. So much so that Ezra 1.6 tells us that some of them, I think, to ease their conscience, even though they didn't go back, they sent a bunch of money with the people who are brave enough to go back. The disobedience of some of Mordecai's and Esther's ancestors not to return I believe, led to a Jewish people at this point who have assimilated into the Persian culture so much so that these Jews are now three generations from ever living in Jerusalem. They've lost their distinctiveness. They've compromised their beliefs and their identity in order to survive and even prosper. This is why Mordecai, I think, has a Persian name that is associated with a Persian male deity. And Mordecai also also appears to be in some kind of governmental position in the citadel. The citadel would be the equivalent of our Capitol Hill. He's in the citadel of Susa, which means he's on the payroll of a pagan king somehow, which to a Jew in that time would have been unthinkable because as a Jew, you you were to be totally set apart from that culture. Perhaps this loss of Jewish distinctiveness and this compromise to want to fit in and survive can explain why both Mordecai and Esther offer no known resistance to what we're going to read now in verses 8 through 11. So if you've got your Bible, let's look there. Verse 8, we read this. Esther was taken. Remind you of a movie you know? Yes, Liam Neeson was not here to help her and bring her back, though. She's taken. She's entrusted to Haggai, the king's eunuch. And the the inference here is that Haggai knows exactly what the king is looking for in a woman. And he sees that in Esther. And so Haggai promotes Esther, gives her special beauty uh, treatments to prepare her for her one night with the king audition. And kind of as a side note, we're told this in verse 10 and 11. This is also repeated in verse 20. That Esther was to keep quiet, even if necessary, lie by omission about her Jewish identity. She was not to say anything about her Jewish identity because Mordecai told her not to do so. Now, the reason that Mordecai told her not to do so, we're not told. Uh, We could go, there's a number of them. I don't have time to go into that today. You can talk to me after if you really want to know that. But bottom line is, she's to deny her Jewish identity. So at this point in the story, we're faced maybe with some other messy questions, right? I mean, knowing what this roundup of virgin women was all about, why didn't Mordecai offer up, put up some kind of resistance? I mean, this is a girl you've raised. Knowing what was going to happen to her. Why didn't he do something? Oh, why didn't Esther resist somehow? Knowing that she was going to have to give up her virginity to a sex-driven king? 
knowing that if she kept her Jewish heritage a total secret, that she was going to have to violate the Sabbath laws, the food laws, the purity laws, all those. Well, you might say, she had no choice, Rick. Didn't you just read it? She's taken. She's been taken. Well, there may be circumstances beyond your control and my control in our culture as well. But if someone is willing to suffer the consequences, even if that means death, full obedience to God's law is, is always an option, right? C.S. Lewis says this, coming up on the screen. Compromise begins when we mistake necessary evils for good. We may get to that point in our culture where we're going to have to wrestle with that. It's clear, in my mind at least, that Esther and Mordecai, Mordecai's first actions significantly distinguish themselves from other biblical heroes and heroines, right? Like, for example, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who would rather choose what? Rather choose death then compromise their obedience to God's law and their identity as a Jew. And is there any doubt about God's commandment that Esther and Mordecai would have known not to have sex outside of the marriage covenant and not to marry a pagan? I mean, remember when the Israelites come back out of captivity in Ezra 9 and 10, God is so angry about the intermarriage of them to pagan wives that he tells them to divorce themselves from them. Coming up on the screen, commentator Karen Jobes writes this. The author, at least at this point, makes no attempt to vindicate Esther or Mordecai by explaining extenuating circumstances or reporting that they had divine counsel to behave as they did. There's lots of questions here. Not all the details we'd like to have. And these questions about the character of Esther and Mordecai they were noticed even by the first translators of the Bible into the Greek, which was the Septuagint, first or second century. When the translators translated this book, they were so conflicted about it that they added in a few things. Okay, they added in the book of Esther an announcement by Esther that she, in fact, had not violated the food laws, and they added it in, into Esther a quote that she, quote, abhorred the bed of the uncircumcised. Well, we'll come back to wrestle a little more with some of these questions. Well, let's try to finish up uh, this part of the story. Here's how this particular part of the story ends, verses 12 through 18. Okay, verse 12 through 14 says that the 12 months, these, women, these virgins would endure 12 months of beauty treatments, uh, 12 months of <laughs> full-time, you know, I'm, I'm, when I'm reading, I'm thinking, man, if you cannot get beautiful in three months of full-time beauty treatments, you should go to another show, like, the, you know, Farmer Wants a Wife, because there it doesn't matter about your beauty, we're looking for strength, right? But uh, 12 months. Now, as I did a little research, I, 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 one commentator said one of the reasons they waited 12 months was they wanted to be fairly sure, and they could be absolutely, that these were virgins, so they would make sure none of them had any pregnancies. So they waited 12 months. Possible. Anyway, when Esther's turn arrives, she follows... Haggai's suggestions as to what to bring, what to wear, and what the king likes. And this young Jewish virgin apparently did whatever it took to sexually satisfy this sex-driven king, Xerxes. She was made queen. Xerxes was so happy through a big party to celebrate the occasion. Now, the chapter concludes in 19 through 23 with a very important event that I think Pastor Steve is going to pick up from next week. It involves Mordecai just so happening to overhear a plot to assassinate King Xerxes. He tells Queen Esther. She goes and tells King Xerxes while giving credit to Mordecai. And as we will see, God's providential hand was working behind the scenes in this quote-unquote divine coincidence for the future of saving God's people. But the question we have to wrestle with today is this, before we close. What was God's providential hand doing here 
in this messy, unsanitized part of the story. On your outline, I put this as the problem. The problem was we have two main characters, the hero and heroine, who seem to be flawed and imperfect. Even Let's put the word sinful in there. It seems that there are, other than Mordecai's uh, refusal to bow to Haman, which we're going to see next week, apart from that, at least in this chapter, the two main characters seem to have no concern for God's laws. The complete absence of this concern makes me at least wonder, have Esther and Mordecai so assimilated into the Persian culture that they have temporarily abandoned their faith, or at least they are living a very compromised condition in order to survive and maybe even prosper. Jesus said we're to be in the world, not of it. Do we have a case here where the Jews are living in Persia, but Persia is actually living inside of the Jews? Does Esther's compromising her Jewish identity because of Mordecai, Mordecai's encouragement to do so, does that mean that they really don't trust God to protect them and provide for them? Is God actually orchestrating these events? Or is he just permitting them? Now, before I give my take on, this, on these questions, I want to acknowledge one thing right up front, that there, there are some morally ambiguous situations here. Difficult situations. Where the situations where you know you could go, hey, here's what I would do. But you don't know what you'd do until you were there. This is where you play armchair quarterback. Like, Mordecai should have done this. Esther should have done that. So you have to just kind of put yourself in maybe something like that. I was thinking today of where our couple's going today to the part of the world they're going to. Islamic extremists, and I'm there with my daughter, 13 at the time. If they knock on my door and they say, hey, we're taking your daughter away to convert her, she's got to come out right now and deny her Christian faith or we're going to kill her. What would you do? Maybe as a dad, you'd say, I'll take out all 10 of these guys with AK-47s. You'll lose. Okay? You could go down valiantly. Maybe you take your daughter aside and say, look, say whatever they want. It really doesn't matter. God understands. He knows. Just say whatever they want. Keep yourself alive. Or maybe you say, hey, never compromise. Never deny your faith. God will provide somehow. If not, you'll see him soon. But never compromise. So we have to be aware that these are tough situations. So my take on what we have here, despite all that, is that we do have two flawed characters who at least, this, at least in this part of the story, things change. They've made some compromises in their faith. And while we can have empathy for our characters, and we should, we can never and cannot condone compromise. I know that this may be kind of unsettling uh, for some, disturbing for some, especially if you grew up with a different version. But seeing, at least in this part of the story, okay, things are going to change. Two flawed and imperfect characters may actually help all of us in this room in two ways. Number one, it may help us see with even greater clarity who is the real hero in this story. There's only one real hero in this story. It is not Esther. It's not Mordecai. It's God and God alone. Throughout the whole story, he is going to be at work to save his people, and nothing will stand in his way. Number two, while God doesn't orchestrate our sinful decisions and compromises, here's the very good news for all of us in this room, I hope. If we humble ourselves, there's a key thing, and we repent of our compromises, turn from them, God will continue to use us to accomplish his purposes. This is the application point I want you to remember today. It's coming up on the screen. Would you say it with me? Just the part God can use. Would you say that with me? God can use your sinful story 
for his glory. One more time. God can use your sinful story for his glory. Last week we said, hey, only the followers of a God who is good, who is merciful, who is absolutely in control of all things, only followers of a God like that can believe in such a crazy uh, and wonderful possible thought that God can use even our worst failures for his glory somehow. Only God can work good out of all things to those who love him. You know what that means for your pagan neighbor? He has no hope of God working through his terrible past. It's only for those who love God. For those who love God, God says, I can use your sinful past. As I read through Esther this time, I've seen at this point of the story a passive, a frightened, a compliant young woman who relies on her own beauty and the advice of other people to get ahead and to survive. But then by the end of this book, I saw a woman transformed into a powerful leader of the Jews. Like all of us, Esther and Mordecai are a work in progress. And I believe it took the possibility of their whole race being being wiped out, being exterminated, to bring them to the point of repentance and fasting over their compromising ways. It took that possibility of, of them being exterminated for them to then start to openly embrace their Jewish identity, no longer hiding it. And God uses them to save their people. And when we repent of our sinful past and our compromises, and when we openly identify as a follower of Jesus, God can do that as well in us. So find hope in this, my friends, coming up on the screen. This is great hope here. God has always been in the business of recruiting imperfect people to do his perfect work. And we should all be glad for this because there's no perfect person sitting here. As far as I know. I know. Yeah, I actually, absolutely know, even if I don't know you. This is what we read this past week in 1 Corinthians, right? That, that God, God delights in choosing the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. That God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God can work through even our imperfect, sinful past decisions and actions to fulfill his purposes, and some of the godliest people in the Bible were flawed. Moses committed murder. David committed adultery and then had her husband murdered. Paul spent his life rounding up, imprisoning uh, Christians and at least approving of their killing. But all of those people and many more came to a point where they repented of their past and God used them in great ways to accomplish his purposes. Our previous compromises with the world do not completely disqualify us from God using us in the future. And we should be so glad of that. God can use your sinful story for his glory. Now, I should say two things here. Um, this does not mean, this truth does not mean that we should go out there and sin boldly all every day, continue to, to just sin so that God can, you know, we can experience his grace and it may abound and God will get more glory. Okay, if you know anything about the New Testament, you know that's debunked a number of times. Paul says that directly in Romans 6 too, right? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, by no means. You, you're, as a follower of Christ, you're not dead to sin. You can't continue in it. And then Jesus says, if we continue in sin, in John 14, 50, Jesus says in John 14 that if we continue in sin, he says that this is proof that we really don't love God like we say we do, but that we actually love ourselves and our pleasures more than we love God. Second thing I want to say is God can't use our past story if we've never repented of our past sins. And by that, I mean a complete repentance. If it involved other people, you should make that right. Or if we try to cover up our unsanitized past and pretend it never happened. So what should we do if we're currently compromising in our faith or have in the past? Here it is. One would be confess 
confess it and repent of it. Don't rationalize it. Don't justify it. Don't say, man, that was a morally ambiguous situation. God would understand. No, repent of it. Secondly, embrace the forgiveness that Jesus went to the cross to provide for everybody in this room. Embrace it. Don't allow Satan to keep you in bondage to past sins that you know you've confessed. He loves to do that. Next, ask God then. Ask God, God, is there, is there any way you want to use this part of my unsanitized past? Is there any way you want to redeem this part of my sinful story somehow for your glory? If you do, just show me how that can happen or make me aware of that. God, God worked through the imperfect decisions of Esther and Mordecai to fulfill his purposes, and he's able to work through our imperfections as well. And when we allow God to do that, he then, he becomes the hero of our story. He becomes the hero of our story. And we start pointing people to Christ, not ourselves, and we point people to Christ and what he has done in and through our lives despite our past sin. Let's allow God to do that. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? As you pray, just spend a few moments. We always ask you to spend just a few moments before you run out the door. Two questions just to, just to ponder over and pray over. Number one would be this. Are you or me, like Esther and Mordecai, compromising your identity as a follower of Christ? For whatever reason, maybe to be more accepted, maybe to avoid some form of ridicule or persecution, maybe to find favor with people. But are you compromising in any way, your identity as a follower of Jesus. It might be in some morally ambiguous situation as you see it, and you've heard Satan whisper in your ear, it's okay, God understands. Let me tell you, when you hear that, you know that you're compromising. Second question would be this. Have you truly repented of your past sin, received God's forgiveness, and are you asking God to redeem your sinful past? Asking him to show you, is there, is there any way he wants to use your sinful story for his glory? Father, I thank you for this reminder today. We're all imperfect. We know that these characters will grow in their repentance and obedience. They'll become braver, more courageous. But God, we know that there's areas in our own life that we, we're living in the same kind of culture as far as ungodly, sex-driven, all of that. But you want us to not compromise in any way, shape, or form. I thank you for your Holy Spirit who gives us the power to resist sin and also convicts us when we are compromising. And I just pray, God, that you would remind us that you do not want compromise in any way, shape, or form in our lives about our identity as followers of Jesus. And God, I pray that you continue to remind us that if we've confessed our past failures and sins and truly repented, God, there's a possibility you want to use that in some way for your glory. And we're thankful that you're, you are a God who can do that. You're the only one who can do that. You're the only one who could take what's evil and, and bring good out of it. So help us to be open to that and rejoice in it. And help, as, as you do that, help us to point people to you. You're the hero of our story, of our redemption, of our forgiveness. Send us out into this world, God, this dark world, to be your light and represent you well. We ask this in the name of Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us and all of God's people said, Amen.